Man, I am like so excited. I got like the guy on manga here. <laughs> um, manga, like studies, manga, making manga, everything. Kofi Bazell Smith, welcome. Happy to be here. Thank you. So let's jump right in here. I, you know, a little bird whispered to me that you first were kind of like you were given Spawn and Amazing uh, Spider Man with yeah. uh, by a friend of a, a co friend of ours, John Jennings. But right. tell me, like, how did you get into comics, man? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's interesting. Uh, I first started drawing comics before I knew what comics were. I was just, I didn't know what panels or anything were. Um, so I, I, I saw Dragon Ball Z when I was eight years old. And I was like, that's what I want to do with the rest of my life right there. Um, so I just start, started drawing full scenes of my own characters. And it was just completely ripping off of Dragon Ball Z and the animes that I saw. Um, <clears throat> I ended up meeting John Jennings when I was around 10 or 11 years old, because he was a professor at the University of Illinois, which is in my hometown. And um, I think my dad got me connected with him. And we would meet at a library, and he would teach me stuff about comics, because he knew that I was interested in it. He gave me Spawn comics and Spider-Man comics. This was my first introduction to, uh, to Western comic books, actually. So before then, I was just watching anime, and I was just drawing full page scenes. And he showed me about paneling and stuff like that. And I, yeah, ever since then, I was like, this is what I want to do. So what was it about, I don't know, um, Kofi, like mm -hmm. what, I mean, there are lots of different ways to tell our stories. So yeah. why was it, yeah, yeah. What, tell me, like what grabbed you here? So I think actually for me in comics and manga, the most interesting, the most fun part for me is actually coming up with a story and telling a story, telling something that's really creative and even fantastical, but you can like embed it with your own themes and your own ideas. So I can talk to people indirectly about the way that I feel about things, um, like through my characters or through what happens to the characters. And it also just happens to be the case that drawing is a lot of fun. You know, I don't really like drawing without storytelling. And um, I don't really like storytelling without drawing. It just always fit for me ever since I was really, really small. I love that. Yeah, that's so amazing. Um, and then you're currently, you're finishing up your uh, BFA, right? Can you tell us, yeah. I know you had a little bit of a kind of, you know, a journey to get oh, to yeah, that. Definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So currently, um, so I'm getting a, a, a BA in studio art, in 2D studio art, Eastern Illinois University. Um, I didn't go back to school until I was 28 years old. I'm 30 now. So I actually took my very first art course two years ago. Uh, I was self-taught before then. So um, when I was 18, I, um, I got a full ride to the University of Illinois just from a collection of scholarships. But I, I, I hated school. I didn't really know what I wanted to do. Um, and I was really into wrestling. I've been doing martial arts my whole life. So um, I dropped out to become a boxer. And um, I've been doing that for the past 11 years as a competitive boxer. I've got like 60 plus fights. And, um, you know, in an interesting way, even though I dropped out, it's probably to the day, to this day, the, um, the best decision I've ever made, because what would have happened is if I would have stayed in school and got my grades, I would have just got some job working for somebody somewhere in some office and not really doing what I wanted to do. Right. So I went for what I wanted to do and I was broke for a long time, um, but it took me a while to figure it out. And it actually took me sending myself to Japan. I paid for myself to go out there while I was a dropout. The first time I went, I went out there for an entire month back in 2017. And that's what finally motivated me to get myself back into school. And now I have a clear path and a clear direction. And that wouldn't have happened until I turned 27. I would have been way out of college and probably stuck somewhere. You know, so I, yeah, I mean, it's, it's never too late. You know, my mentor went back to school when he was 28. And uh, he just did a year long fellowship at Harvard. So it, yeah, it's, yeah. Is that our friend Stacy? That's Stacy, that's exactly what I'm talking about. Yeah, he's been a huge motivator for me and he's been my mentor for the past three or four years. And he really made me, cause I met him when I first came back from Japan in 2017. I came back with no money. I saved up $5,000 to get out there. I was just working a, a temp job, making $10 an hour. I just didn't spend any money and just grinded, worked a lot of overtime. And um, he saw something in me and he started sort of teaching me how to turn comics into like a teaching career and figure out how to, how to navigate um, the university more so as a tool and a resource 
as opposed to something that just tells you what to do, you know. So amazing. So important for us to have those role models. And um, yeah, you've got some good ones right there. When you were in Japan, um, mm -hmm. you, as from what I can tell you, studied, you've continued to do some more formal study um, at the Kyoto Seika. Um, yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. So Kyoto Sex, so this was the second time I was in, so the first time I went to Japan, I was at a private language school where I took a, a course on manga storytelling. Um, I got really lucky because during that summer, nobody else signed up for the course. So it was just me and the professor. It was just one-on-one, -on -one, like four hour sessions and he didn't speak English. So my Japanese level like skyrocketed because I'm, I just like study on my own. So I, it was like a huge bump up when I went to Japan. Then when I came back, I was like, I want to get back into school because I heard about this thing called scholarships and I think they'll pay for it. And that's what happened. 2019, I went back for a semester in Japan. And I didn't pay for anything. Um, I took courses at Kansai Gaidai University, which is a foreign language university. And they actually have a manga production course where um, you actually produce and print a manga by the end of the semester. And we actually sold it. We created an anthology. Um, and Kyoto Seika University is about two hours away, right? This is in Kyoto. I was in Hirakata, which is a city two hours away. It is, um, it's known as the premier manga research institution in the world, actually. This is the only place you can get a graduate degree in manga in the entire world still. Um, I put myself out there. I carry my portfolio with me everywhere. Even though I'm not the best artist, I wasn't afraid to talk to people. Even though I'm not totally fluent in Japanese, I wasn't afraid to talk to people. And I connected with another um, aspiring mangaka who had graduated from Kyoto Seka at, um, it was like a, a manga event where you can meet with publishers and show them your work and get feedback and stuff. So I went there just on a whim. It's like, why not? So I met another guy who was showing his work. He said he graduated from Kyoto Seka. I was like, oh my God, that's my dream school. I've been emailing Kyoto Seka for years and they've been turning me down because I'm just, I had like a 2.0 GPA when I graduated from community college. So you know, they're like, who is this? Um, he was like, would you like to meet my professor? And I said, yeah, I've been, th I've been looking at this school for years. Um, he hooked me up with his professor, gave me his email. I met um, Professor Akira Saso in the manga store. There's a, they have a manga storytelling department a whole department dedicated wow. to manga story. To, it's insane. Um, he's an award-winning artist. He won a Tezuka Cultural Prize, which is one of the biggest awards you can receive. And basically he mentored me every Monday for the remainder of my stay. I would catch the train for two hours to meet him in Kyoto. I would um, audit his uh, figure drawing course and go to his office and he just started giving me homework. Um, and he also, he gave me the, so this is the storytelling textbook for, uh, for Kyoto Seka. So this is only available to Kyoto Seika students. Um, and it uses manga and it teaches like storytelling techniques. These aren't taught anywhere else. And it's, you know, it's only written in Japanese. And because I reached out to somebody, I don't think I really had the skills to qualify to get into school there. But because I was somebody who was willing to reach out and willing to try and use my Japanese and, you know, be honest about who I am and what I'm about, people accepted me. And that's what's, I think, got me to, to where I am and be able to sort of study informally at that university. Wow, really, really amazing, um, Kofi. Let me ask you, um, yeah. while we're on this t the subject of your kind of origin story, mm -hmm. was there something about manga and wanting to become mangaka uh, that was spoke to you and resonated with you differently to Western comics? You know, that's interesting because I actually really do like Western comics. Um, I wonder if the reason that I like manga so much was that was my first contact. So I, like I said, when John Jennings gave me those Spider-Man and Spawn comics, I had never, ever laid my hands on a Western comic. I was already in middle school and I had already been reading manga. Um, there are some elements of manga. I think I'm conditioned because it was early. I really like the black and white contrast, to be perfectly honest. Um, because manga is it's traditionally drawn in black and white and there's screen tones, which are just really small uh, black dot patterns. There's some like cinematographic elements uh, to manga. It really feels like you're watching a movie, um, which the godfather of manga, known as the godfather of manga, Osamu Tezuka, he adapted a lot of Western film techniques and like he even studied Disney and he sort of reshaped what modern manga is. So it, it really does use 
film techniques. Um, it uses, Scott McCloud says that manga uses a lot of action to action panels. Scott McCloud was another big influence on me in comics. I was reading this when I was a kid too, understanding comics and making comics. Um, it feels very, very active, I guess. And you know what's interesting, um, what's really interesting is most of my American friends and non-Japanese friends that are into manga are black. Mm. There's so many black people into anime and manga. And it's like this, I feel like it's still an uh, untapped community. There's so many of us online that talk about this stuff that are into Japanese popular culture and video games and manga. I think there's something there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, there, you know, might even be, you know, um, there was a many, many, like even James Baldwin, but many folk who moved out of the U.S. because they could, yeah. just couldn't handle the race relations, the racism yeah. in this country, yeah. Yeah. found a certain kind of liberty uh, being black in another yeah. kind of national space. And maybe yeah. there's something there, you know, Kofi. There absolutely is. So, I mean, James Baldwin, he moved to France. Um, that was Japan for me. So mm -hmm. it was really interesting. The blood isn't in the sand when you go to Asia, or when you go to Japan. So it's really, really cool. People see me as a foreigner, not as a dangerous black person. So I get treated like, mm -hmm. like white people, like Hispanic people, like Middle Eastern people. We're, we, it's, it's all on the same level. And it's like, in a way, it's like a fresh start, and it's like you're invisible, invisible at the same time. Um, that whole context of a history of oppression is gone, and in a weird way, I so I said this the first time I came back from Japan, I felt like I could breathe, and it that's what made me decide to go back to school to look at my life differently. That's abs I think that's absolutely correct. Yeah. Wow, wow, so inspiring yeah. to hear you, Kofi. Yeah. Really, really. Mm -hmm. um, you talk about your work as a kind of bridging of the US with Asia. Um, mm -hmm. Can you talk about what that means to you along with this creative journey? Absolutely, yeah, yeah. So in a broader context, I don't, it's not just US and Asia, not just US and Japan, not just black people and Japanese people. I think um, one of the greatest gifts that you can give yourself is to talk to people who don't look like you um, and who aren't from the same place as you. I think it just gives you such a broader perspective on what it means to be a human being and what it means to operate in this world because we all in a sense i think we all deal with the same problems and we the th the same things it's really interesting the first time i went to japan it was it's it seems like a really small thing but to me it was this huge epiphany that people laugh at the same kind of jokes even though it's in a totally different language you know fart jokes are still funny and in spanish french japanese korean or whatever you know and it's like it it you see how connected we all are and you see some of the differences, but really the main thing is you see the similarities. I also think uh, learning a foreign language can improve your brain function. I started studying Chinese at 28 years old. Don't let anybody tell you it's too late. And I've got like, I've gotten hundred percent on every assignment. It's, I think it's, it's, it's how you focus. And it's not just because of some of it might be ability because I've studied some other languages, but I've seen other people start a foreign language late. I don't think it's ever too late if you're really engaged in, in what it is, you know, you, you do bad on, um, on a subject or in a class, if you don't like it. Um, that's, that, that's an aside about language though. Um, I think it gives you a perspective from the other side of the planet when you engage with another culture. And I think that's really important. So that's a broader context. Mm. Um, the reason why I sort of chose the United States and Japan, one, I'm from the United States. You know, so <laughs> I'm sort of married to that. And I've, I've always been interested in Japanese culture. And one of the things I realized as an adult is I don't have to try and be what society molds me to be. I can make the things that I like my job. You know, I think a lot of people might not realize that. I know maybe I have some sort of privileges there that I do have to recognize, but I think if you can take the things that you like and let that be the thing that you do. You know, you don't have to, if, if you like working in an office, that's fine. But if that's not what you want to do, if you're creative, you can make that happen. And I think going to Japan and just jumping out there, remember I was broke, um, helped me sort of to realize that. Man, you are an inspiration, Kofi. <laughs> let me ask you this. Um, we've got a couple, we've got some, um, a couple of pages of your work here on the oh, yeah. slide. Can you yeah. like, 
just break some of this down in terms of this kind sure. of U.S. bridging, this new space, this new space of creativity that you're kind of birthing into the world? Yeah, so I'm, I'm, this is still a journey where I'm trying to figure out. So as you can see here on the left, this is Climb. This is my most recent comic that I did. I submitted it to the... So another interesting thing is manga, I think, is on the forefront of Japanese international outreach. I actually argued that in a research proposal I made. Um, the Tezuka Manga Contest, for the first time in 50 years, they just opened up to international uh, competitors. So you could only submit in English, Spanish, Korean, or Chinese, not in Japanese. Um, so I think manga is, I mean, and that's, there's also an international manga award by the Japanese government. So they're trying to foster these cross-cultural relations. So I'm trying to, you know, sort of ride that wave. And I'm, I'm studying Japanese culture. I'm studying Japanese history. As you can see on the third image here, this is my most recent work called uh, Rabbit and Toad, Usagi Tokairu. It's, um, it's inspired by uh, 12th and 13th century Japanese scrolls and some like ukiyo-e art style. But I'm also trying to mix in like Western cinema, uh, cinematography. Um, I'm really trying to find the balance and my own voice, which is why I'm doing a lot of short stories right now and I'm just submitting them to magazines. Um, how I can sort of represent my people and myself with black representation, how I can sort of engage with this culture that I'm so interested in. So I'm making, I'm producing works in English and Japanese simultaneously. I, I translate them myself and I just have a bunch of native speakers check them. Um, so yeah, I'm doing a bunch of short stories. Some of them are focused on Japanese culture. Some of them are dealing with black issues. And this is just me trying to find my voice by studying both cultures and both, both languages. You know, um, it reminds me back in the day when I stumbled on Afro Samurai and yeah. I was just like, what? Yeah. It was so dope. <laughs> Man, like, yeah. but it's that intersection that creates, mm -hmm. it's so vital, right? That these yeah. intersections, right? Not exactly. Not, not being like so rigid where you're like, it has to be this way, right? Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, you don't want to get stuck. You find what you do, you know? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So inspiring. Let me ask you, like here we've got a page um, in uh -huh. process and how you, you got the, an idea in your brain. How do yeah. you materialize it? What, what is that? So, what are those steps? What's that process? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So ideas come in a lot of different ways. Uh, sometimes, so I love taking walks. Henry David Thoreau has a whole, whole essay dedicated to just walking and <laughs> how people forgot about the, the wonders of walking. But anyway, um, sometimes it's a conversation between two characters. Sometimes it's a random scene. It's almost like I'm creating and playing little scenes from movies in my head. Just anything that comes to mind, if there's some kind of concept, a character idea, um, something that I might see on the ground, I keep notes in my phone. I have like so many, so many, over a hundred pages of notes. Sometimes it's just like a random little blurb and that will sort of sprout out and flower out into a story, right? So you don't think of, for, for me personally, I don't think of a story or a page from start to finish, you know what I mean? Like not chronologically. I think they really flower out the concepts and some of them, I'll, I'll sit on for a couple of years, right? But you just have these, so many ideas. So when I'm ready to create a story, um, once that idea is sort of manifested into something more concrete, I'll, I'll write a script. This is just the way I do it. And it's a pretty detailed script. So I say what goes in each panel. Um, I think about uh, what camera angle, because um, different camera angles mean different things, right? Um, a close-up, you don't want to spam too many close-ups because a close-up means something important is happening. You want your audience to focus on it. What is in this character's hand or why am I focusing on their face? What's the expression? Um, a long shot, if you want to show details of the background, you know, and, and a high angle over the headshot, if you want to show a character being like weak or small or scared or something like that. So I think about all these things, all these camera angles, the dialogue. Then next, I draw little thumbnails, really, really tiny thumbnails. Um, I got a bunch here actually because I'm, I'm working on a comic now. Um, I draw thumbnails like, I don't know if you can see this here. Mm -hmm. That's a thumbnail for a page. Mm. Okay. Um, yeah. And then after I do all the thumbnails, I do what's called the name, the name of a page, which is like a really, really loose sketch. This is the piece that I'm working on right now. So in, in manga, this is called a name. It's like a really, really loose sketch and layout of the page. And then after that, I got, I got all my work right here. So that name, you have the manuscript draft. 
which you do on either A4 or B4 uh, manuscript paper and pencil. And then you ink over it. This is just my process. This is usually how it's done. And then after I ink it, um, so I ink with the G pen, which is here. This is a dip pen. And what's nice about the G pen, which is a pretty standard manga tool, is how much pressure you put down because it's made out of two blades. So when you put pressure down, it splits and you can make wide and thin lines really easily just by changing the pressure. Um, I really, really love the G pen. Um, after you ink it, you let it dry, you erase the pencils. So then you just got solid black and white inks. Um, and then you scan your images in. And um, I, I use a, a program called Clip Studio Paint, which is the, it's the Photoshop for mangaka basically. So mangaka means manga artist. That's what the Kai is. Um, and uh, since COVID, I haven't been able to get to a scanner. So I figured out, I just use my cell phone. I just take pictures of my panels. I upload them on the computers and I add screen tones. As you can see, these grays here, those are actually really tiny dot patterns. Um, and I just do my cleanup. And yeah, that's the process for a page. Wow, I love it. It's, uh, it's really incredible, the process. Um, really, I love the way also that you're still using ink on paper, you know. Um, love paper, man. It feels so good, man. <laughs> it feels really good. Yeah, awesome. <laughs> um, so, Kofi, you, yeah. you have like this extraordinary journey for such a young man here. Okay. Um, taking, you know, a lot taking takes a lot of courage to do what you did. Go just to like say, you know what, I'm I'm gonna pack up and head to a country that I don't know the language, I don't know anything, but I love I love manga. And um, but you also you're a boxer. How does yeah. boxing and comics like fit together in your <laughs> yeah. world? It doesn't sound like they fit together. Um, and, you know, I, discovered, I actually discovered this the first time I was in Japan. I actually boxed the, full, the both times I was in Japan. And um, I actually was able to get an exhibition match in a really major city um, last December. Um, it was great. Um, I found a way for boxing and manga to work, boxing, manga, and Japanese, and my interest, all to sort of fit together. Um, so I think in a weird way, it gives me balance, right? Um, Manga is known, I think, in the artist world, especially in Japan, as something that's really taxing and really demanding. And in the sports world, boxing is known as something that's really taxing and really demanding. So you would think that because I, I pretty much what I do all day is if I'm not doing my homework, I'm in the boxing gym training or teaching or I'm drawing manga, you would think I would be tired. Um, I think they balance each other out so well. And in a weird way, they sort of revitalize each other because I'm using different parts of my brain and my body. And I'm giving the other parts a rest, if that makes sense. Um, like boxing is really active. There isn't really much time to think. You got to think. It's like, you know, it's like really active, fast chess. Um, and I think manga, when you're, especially when you're planning, when you're drawing, it's really slow. You know, I like to listen to classical music. Um, it's like almost like I'm in another world as I was when I was just in the boxing gym. And while I'm in that other world, when I'm resting and relaxing and I'm drawing manga and I'm really thinking and using my mind in a different way, I feel like my boxing muscle is getting rest and I can go straight to the gym. And it's like, they're just feeding off of each other and like revitalizing each other. Yeah, and um, in their different way though, they're taking you to that place of the flow, right? The flow. Absolutely, yeah, 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 absolutely. Love it. Um, tell me, um, I know you're a student now, but I know you also teach manga. I have yeah. your YouTube yeah. channel and you do a lot of other stuff. Can you tell us, can you share some of your methods for this? Absolutely, yeah. So I'm sort of in the beginning of my career. I started teaching a free manga workshop when I first came back from Japan in 2017. I uh, became president of the Japanese Culture Club at my community college. I started the one at my current university because there wasn't one. And it's nice, I highly recommend joining a club for any students who are watching this because it gives you access to classroom. And if you have access to a classroom, you can teach the things that you like. It's not about making money. You can put that on your resume and you can meet other people who are into that. And then your, you know, your career, could, that's, that's how it happened. That's how I'm doing what I am now. I just started teaching free workshops based on what I learned. Um, and most of my workshops, the way that I frame them is I focus on storytelling as opposed to how to draw. I actually think it's an error to claim that manga has a specific art style. I think there's something that's like sort of culturally manga, like the big eyes and pointy chins that was really inspired by Osama Tezuka. But 
that's not what it takes in order for something to be manga. If you look at an artist like Ryoichi Ikegami, who did, um, I think he did the very first Spider-Man manga. He did um, Crying Freeman. His art, it's manga, but it's, it's very realistic. They, they don't have the pointy chins and the, and the big eyes. And he doesn't use the gyongo, which is like the Japanese onomatopoeia sound effects, but it's still manga. So what I learned when I went to Japan is manga is more so based on the storytelling structure, which is called Kisho Tenketsu. It's a four arc storytelling structure adapted from ancient Chinese poetry. Um, and I'm pretty sure it's used throughout Japanese narrative. So it goes, you know, the normal Western plot structure we learn in like language arts in eighth grade, at least I did, is introduction, conflict, and then resolution, right? I know there are some differences like Demi Moi and stuff like that. It's, it's taught in different ways. Um, in, in Japan and in the East, it's introduction, development, twist, conclusion. It's a totally different structure where the twist is the most important part. Everything is centered around the twist. Mm -hmm. So when I teach my manga workshops, I teach something called Yonkoma manga, which means four panel manga. And it's basically the way that professional mangaka, when they train to tell good stories, they learn how to tell an entire story in only, in only four panels. So it goes intro, development, twist, conclusion. And that's your whole story, just one page, four panels. Um, and the way that I see it is, um, so this is what I used to do when I used to, I used to come up with stories and I used to try and draw manga. Ever since I was a kid, I never finished anything. Never, ever finished anything because they were too grand, right? I was doing a story that said, this is going to be like 10 books. It's going to be an ongoing series. And I've never even done one book before. So I feel like you should be able to tell a story in one book before you tell a series. You should be able to tell an entire story in one chapter, a full story in one chapter from start to finish where you can, mm. where your audience is satiated in one chapter before you can tell a story in one book. And I think you should be able to tell a whole story in one page before you can tell a story in one chapter. So my workshop is teaching people how to tell a story in a page. Wow. Uh, and those four very important panels, right? Intro, yeah. development, twist, resolution. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Where for you as a creator and also as a reader of mm -hmm. manga, of comics yeah. generally, um, and manga is the Japanese word for comics, so let's just exactly. get, get that out there. Um, yeah. Right. Where's the vitality, Kofi? Where, where are you feeling the life force? You know what? What's really interesting is I think Japan is really working hard and looking for international creators. I think they're really trying to expand. It's interesting because it's such a homogenous place. It's such a homogenous place. But my experience being in Japan and speaking with Japanese people, you would think that like, oh, this isn't real manga. You're, you're an American. No, they love it. They absolutely love it. And they love it when they see concepts that aren't Japanese. Um, that's why, you know, the, the, the Japanese government, actually, the, um, the Ministry of, uh, I forgot what it's called. I think the Ministry of Health, Labor, and Welfare, maybe. The Japanese government um, created an international manga contest specifically for this goal. The Tezuka Manga Contest, after 50 years, just opened up to international creators. There's so many internet foreign uh, manga contests. Um, there's Black-owned manga collectives in the United States, like Noir Caesar and Saturday AM, that are really on top right now. The first Black-owned anime studio was gaining popularity, um, a guy named Artel Isom over in Tokyo. It's a Black-owned anime studio. I think this is the direction that it's taken. And on top of that, I want to bring back up uh, Kyoto Seika University, the place um, that I got to study at informally. So again, it's the premier manga research institution. They have like something like 60 or 70 people on faculty just that teach manga. It's ridiculous. Um, in 2021, they have two new majors coming out. Cultures of Africa and Asia is a major and global studies coming out in 2021. Kyoto Seka has the first and only black president of a Japanese university ever, right? They're, this is right at the forefront. Yeah, since, just since 2018. Um, yeah. Wow. I, I think manga is right at the forefront. I think it's time mm -hmm. for other creators, creators who aren't from Japan, to, sh to start sharing our stories. But the biggest issue is you can't learn manga in English yet, or you got to learn manga in Japanese. Right. Nobody teaches manga in English. 
um, which is what I'm trying to do. That's why I want to go back to Japan. I just applied for a research program to go to Japan so I can study more and sort of bring these lessons back because I'm still in my studying phase, obviously. Yeah, we got to get you through that to the other side so we can get you into these spaces as a, as a professor. Um, yeah. Um, I'm so excited. You're, you know, John Jennings, this is John Jennings' um, concept of himself as a critical maker. Um, okay. You, Kofi, as a critical maker, what's next for you? Yeah, so, so right now, um, so, I'm, so I can, I'm continuing to work on short stories, which the way that you debut as a, so I want to debut as a professional mangaka. I want that industry experience. Um, some of it for me, but mostly so I can get industry experience and take it back so I can teach. Um, because you can be a self-published mangaka. I've already got a couple of books out and I'm going to publish this one on my own, but I feel like I'd be more legitimate if I published through a Japanese, um, magazine because that's like the way that it's supposed to go and work with real publishers because, you know, this is a, this is a cultural form, a cultural medium, and I want to be true to it. So I want to debut in a magazine. So I'm continuing to produce what's called one shots and the way that you debut in a magazine, like if you look at Naruto, Dragon Ball, One Piece. Those were all one shots, a fully contained story in one chapter. And you win an award, the magazine takes you in and it becomes a serial. So as I'm working on that, I'm just continuing to pr produce a lot of one shots. I just applied for a Fulbright. Um, I submitted my Fulbright so I can study formally at Kyoto Seka. Uh, professor Sasao and another professor, they both wrote me like a letter of recommendation to bring me into the school. So now I'm just waiting. I did everything I had to do there. I really hope I get it. It'll be 10 months of researching manga there and interviewing professionals this would be and translating all the interviews uh i did my best on my uh on all my essays and i got everything in on time so i'm just waiting my backup plan if i don't get the the fulbright to study at kyoto seka is to move straight into graduate school so i'm going to do graduate school either way i want to get an mfa and be around more uh more artists hopefully in a pretty international environment but i um you know, I just started taking art courses two years ago. So there's still a lot of things that I have to learn. And I think manga does use a lot of Western art principles that you learn in studio art, like figure and stuff like that. So I still have a lot to learn, I guess, in all these categories. That's we all next. still have a We're lot more studying. We all have a lot to learn. <laughs> yeah. um, Kofi, I'm just so excited. I'm so excited that you shared a little bit of your journey with us. Yeah. Um, creating, studying, teaching manga, becoming a mangaka, and, uh, and why they matter. Thank you, Kofi. Thank you. Thank you for having me.